Okay, I found I'd skipped over page four. The problem is five and six on it. And then we'll say we'll do five, six in the last two problems, and we'll be done with the test. Okay, this has got to be your favorite problem. I know it isn't for all of you yet, but it needs to be. A max min problem on a closed interval. See, this is on the interval, zero to two with the square brackets. That means it's a closed interval. You're essentially applying the extreme value theorem. It says a max that a continuous function, and polynomials are continuous, on a closed interval has a max and a min that either occurs at an endpoint or at one of the critical numbers. Critical numbers are where the derivatives are zero or not defined. So you already have the endpoints. You just need to find where the derivative is zero or undefined. So take the derivative, nice easy one, set it equal to zero, and solve it. When you solve this, x squared minus 1 equals 0, 4x minus 0 gives you x equals 0, x squared minus 1 equals 0 gives you x equal plus or minus 1. Now, 0 was already one of our endpoints, so that didn't add any new information. Uh, x equals plus or minus 1, the minus 1 is not between 0 and 2, but I will use the positive 1. So I evaluate the original function. The original, that's the key. Some of you are sticking your values back in the derivative because you want the maximum of the original function. So we're going to stick the 0 into x to the 4th minus 2x squared and then the 1 into that function and then the 2 into the original function. And we're going to find the biggest value is 8, which occurs at x equals 2, and the smallest value is negative 1, which occurs at x equals 1. We then declare, they ask for the x values. The maximum, and I think it's really good to say the maximum of 8 occurs at x equals 2. That way you, you know, answer the question no matter what they ask. And the minimum of negative 1, that's inserted right there, occurs at x equals 1. All they needed was the x equals 2 and x equals 1 there for the maximum min. Okay, uh, we've got this container problem. And you should be convinced that all of these problems like this are exactly the same. At least I hope that you see them being the same. At the end of calculus in a nutshell, it talks about maximum problems. It says these problems always contain two equations. One equa equation is going to be maximized or minimized, and the other one is called a constraint or a secondary equation. Most problems will require you to draw a picture and label it with the variables to be used. So we're going to build a box on, on this first example here. This is just like the one you're doing. Um, and it's got a volume of 100. So this is not your problem, but that would be for a you know, basic box like this. Boom, 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 boom. And it has a square base, x by x. We don't know what its height is. Um, and this guy's evidently got a top and a bottom. But its volume is length times width times height. That's on the first page of calculus in a nutshell. If you need that formula, length times width times height, that's your volume. It's going to be a fixed number, 100. That's not what you're maximizing or minimizing. You are maximizing or minimizing the total surface area. Well, what's that? Um, well, it's going to be the front and the back. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's going to be the two, the, the bottom, and this guy's the top. They'd each be x by x. So that's x squared for their area. There's two of them. 2x squared, plus it has these four sides that are all x times h high, okay? Um, now, what am I talking about when I'm saying that? Um, yeah, it's going to be, it doesn't look like it, but that's an h. you got the front and the back and the right and the left sides. They're all x by h, so that's 4xh. How do you finish the problem? You solve your constraint for h, and you plug the value in there and finish the problem. Here's another one. We've done one like this on a test, too. These are two, problem, two uh, equations you're supposed to know. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared. That's just the area of its base times its height. Its total surface area, then, is uh, there's uh, top, the top and bottom of the can would be two circles, 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. That is the wrapper on the can. And we talked about that in class. These are just two formulas that you need to know. Okay, but once you, you've got here, what do you do? Well, this is the one that's a fixed number, okay? Um, and this time, it's the surface area that is the constraint. 
Last time it was the volume, but the surface area is the fixed number this time. It's 100. We're going to solve this for a variable, probably h, and plug it in there. That's going to make that an equation in one variable. It's just going to have r's in it. We'll take the derivative of set equal to 0. Here's one that was one of a homework problem at some point in time. What do we got? Well, we've only got 200 feet of fence. That's our constraint. Okay, and all of these places where x's and y's is where we're having fence in these two adjacent corrals. So what do we know? 1, 2, 3, 4 x's plus 1, 2, 3, 4 y, 3 y's. That's your fence. That's your constraint. That's your fixed number. Okay, you're maximizing area. All right, so area is 2xy. Just like the, every one of these problems, you're going to solve your constraint for a variable. So I'll solve this for either x or y. I'll replace one of them there, and then I'll finish the problem. The finish of the problem we'll talk about on our uh, next one here. If you want the watering troughs, pretty complex. I'm going to leave it. Okay. Now back to our problem. Our guy has no top, but it's a square base like the example on the other page. It's got the height that's not the same. If, you know, if they want it to be the same, they tell you it's the same. Um, now, we want to find the dimensions of the container, which use the least amount of material. All right. Okay, you should interpret the least amount of material as being the minimum. You're going to minimize the surface area, subject to a volume that is, in this case, a fixed number of 256. So this is our constraint. It's our fixed number. We're maximizing or minimizing, in this case, the uh, surface area equation, which I've actually shown down below on the left. That's later work over there. Okay, now, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to have to, we've got this. How did we get this? The volume of a box, length times width times height, x squared times h is 256. Okay, now we want to minimize the surface area. What does it come from? It comes from the bottom, x squared. There's no top, so I don't have a second x squared like I had on the other page. Plus, it has four sides that are all x by h. Here's again, if I you know, make my drawing better, you'll be able to see there are more h's in there. So every one of the, the front and the back and the right and the left all have dimensions x by h. Okay, I probably made my drawing worse there. <laughs> okay, so these are the four sides, okay, and that's the bottom. Now what you want to do, we already solved this for h up here. Take that value and replace the h you have here to turn this into a single variable in this equation. Once you have that, do not take your derivative right now. Simplify first. It makes the problem so much easier. Okay, This simplifies to this expression which I can bring the x up as a negative 1, and this is a really easy derivative to take. So this is the derivative then is 2x minus 1024 x to the negative 2. Okay, simple power rule. Bring the power up front, lower the power by 1. Okay, and then I wrote that in more normal notation. After you take the derivative, you've got to find your critical numbers, because that's where maxes and mins occur, if it's, if it's an open interval. Okay, and this is an open interval. So, I'm going to take my derivative, set it equal to 0. Okay, now what I've done is I've added this term over to the right. Then I've multiplied x, the x squared there to make this x cubed is 512. Uh, the, that comes from uh, dividing the 1024 by 2. x is the cube root of 512. I, if you guys left it at the cube root of 512, that was okay. But you might want to just try numbers. I mean, clearly that's less than 1,000. So if it's something cubed, it's some number less than 1,000 cubed. And 8 times 8 is 64 times 8 is 512. Makes your answer easier. X is 8. Y is going to be 4 by uh, plugging the X equals 8 right back in there. So potentially, this is going to be my answer. Now what you have to do to make sure it's your answer is you have to verify that X equals 8 gives you a map, gives you a minimum. Uh, and there's a couple ways to do it. Three ways are shown here. Here's your first derivative argument down in this little box. If you can state that x prime, s prime in this case, changes from negative to positive at zero, and that's the only sign change there is, you've proved that you have an absolute minimum 
at x equals 8, because changing from negative to positive is a minimum. The second derivative, there's a couple ways to make your argument. One way is just to evaluate the second derivative only at 8, which means I went and found the second derivative just by taking the derivative of that expression. Okay, and that gave me this. If you plug in an 8, I didn't evaluate that, but I know it's 2 plus some of positive numbers positive. S prime of 8 is, 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 that says equal, oh, it says that's greater than 0 and the first derivative equals 0. The first derivative test says exactly that. If the second derivative at a number is positive and the first derivative is 0, you've got a minimum. Since this is our only critical number, it's an absolute minimum. Another argument that I frequently made in class is I said, look, here's the second derivative, and for all x's that make sense in this problem, all positive ones, my second derivative is always positive, always greater than 0. So for all x, the second derivative is greater than 0. For all x greater than 0, my function s is always concave up, and s prime equals 0 implies s equals 8 is a minimum, in fact, absolute minimum. So any of those for justifications. We did pretty good on, on our Riemann sum. I was real happy there. Uh, here's our function, x squared plus 2. We're supposed to be using uh, a su an interval from 0 to 4 with just two subintervals, which means two rectangles. So our delta x, our width of each rectangle, would be 4 minus 0 from the intervals there, divided by 2 is 2. Okay? Now, um, we need to figure out what is my function value, 2 and 4. If we're too wide, then I'm going to go from 0 to 2 and 2 to 4 for my two rectangles. My rectangles are going to look like this. They're going to be over approximations because the function is increasing and I have right endpoints. Okay, now uh, I need f of 2. Well, the function was x squared plus 2, so that's 2 squared plus 2 is 6. I need f of 4, that's 4 squared plus 2 is 18. So it's length times width. It's 6 for my first height times a width of 2 plus 18 for my second height times a width of 2, and you get 48. Okay, finally, last problem. Only an hour worth of video here. Okay, uh, a snowball melts so the surface area decreases at a rate of 2 cubic centimeters per minute. Find the rate at which the diameter decreases when the diameter is 10 centimeters. And they give us the formula for the surface of this ball. In general, don't assume you're going to be given um, formulas, but in this case, it's not one of our basics, uh, so they gave it to us. But know the ones on calculus in a nutshell's first page. All righty. Um, what have we got? When the diameter is 10, we would know the radius would be 5, because they ask us to do this when the diameter is 10. There's nothing involving r right here, so I'm going to show this two different ways. Okay, In my first way, in either way, the surface decreasing at a rate of 2 would give me a ds dt, if I call s the surface area, of negative 2. There is a way to make that positive, it just depends on how you interpret it and what you state your answer is. But negative 2 is typically what you use for a decrease. Okay. We're finding which the rate at which the um, that ugly word there is can't even hardly read is diameter. Find the rate at which the diameter decreases. We're finding dddt. We'll have to interpret the negative or positive on the dddt though. Okay. Well, all we have to do then is take their surface area formula they gave us and di differentiate it with respect to t. The adt. Remember our formula. Well, right above there is a equals 4 pi r squared. So dA dt is, bring the 2 out front, 8 pi r times dr dt. Now, if you plug in the negative 2 for your dA dt, the radius was 5, remember, when the diameter is 10. We're here. And now if you just divide by that, which is 40 pi, that's your dr dt, or negative 1 over 20 pi is your dr dt. It doesn't ask... Oops. It doesn't ask for dr dt. It asks for uh, the rate at which the diameter is changing, which would be d for diameter, d d d t. Now, some people just multiplied by 2 that. I felt like they need to justify why is dr dt twice d d d t. And you get that by taking the derivative here with respect to time. 
d d d t equals the derivative of 2r, which is 2, times dr dt. And that establishes the reason why d d d t is twice negative 20, 1 over 20 pi, which gives you negative 1 over 10 pi. Now answer their question. The negative means that it's decreasing. So diameter is decreasing at negative 1 over 10 pi centimeters per second. Now you wouldn't say it's decreasing at negative because that's a negative sort of like a double negative statement. The other way to do the problem, which a lot of people attempted but very few people were successful on, was here. S is 4 pi r squared, the same beginning. They realized diameter was twice radius, so they solved for radius as d over t, and they substituted. Where they failed to, and this makes it easier, but where they failed to get the problem right is they should have squared this first before they did anything else because people who didn't do that f forgot to use a chain rule that would apply and got the question wrong. If you square it though, that's great, because look, the fours cancel, and all you're going to take the, the derivative of is s equals pi d squared. So that would give us that ds dt equals 2 pi d, that's the power rule again, bring the 2 out, times dd dt. All we have to do then is plug in that ds dt was negative 2, and we were doing this when the diameter was 10, and we've solved it for dd dt all in one swoop there. And the same answer would be given, because the minus meant the diameter was decreasing at 1 over 10 pi. Okay, well, this was an extremely long bunch of videos, almost an hour. I hope that it's helpful to you.